All right, well, welcome. Uh, thank you all for coming to this uh, Thursday evening fellows lecture by Tim Jacobs entitled Duty or Virtue, which does the church need more? If you don't know me, I'm Robin Harris and I'm the communications director at the Davenant Institute. At the Davenant Institute, our mission is to preserve and make accessible the wisdom of classical Protestant Protestantism in order to renew and build up the contemporary church. Uh, we do uh, many things as a part of this mission. We publish books, including many translations and modernizations of forgotten works of the Reformation. We have a residential study center in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains in South Carolina. And uh, there we will host events, invite people to come out and study and pray and build community with like-minded Christians. Uh, and of course, we run Davenant Hall, a full graduate level college where we bring in prominent scholars and academics to teach classes on biblical studies, philosophy, systematic theology, ethics, literature, and much more. So one of the things we do regularly in order to give people a taste of Davenant Hall is that we invite some of these scholars to present some of their research and expertise to the public. And that's what these uh, monthly lectures are for. So tonight's lecture is by Tim Jacobs. Tim is a lecturer in philosophy at the Davenant Institute and assistant to the provost. He is a PhD candidate in philosophy at the University of St. Thomas in Texas. He holds a master's in philosophy from there, as well as a master of divinity and master of theology from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. He specializes in ancient and medieval metaphysics, especially Aristotle and Aquinas, virtue ethics, natural law, metaphysics, and classical logic. He has published several articles, as well as contributed to four views on Christian metaphysics, Jonathan Edwards Encyclopedia, and the Lexham Bible Dictionary. His lifelong aim is to invest in the health of the church by reviving the unity between philosophy and theology. He lives with his wife and three kids in California. If you would like to support his work uh, financially or just follow his work, he's got uh, many blog posts and videos and a lot of interesting stuff up at his website which is tljacobs.com, so be sure to check that out. The format for tonight is that Tim will lecture for about 45 minutes or an hour, and then we will take a short three-minute break, and then I will lead a time of question and answer. Uh, feel free to drop your questions into the Q&A box on your screen throughout the lecture, um, and I think we have chat disabled. Um, if not, please do just put your questions in the Q&A feature and not the chat feature because uh, otherwise questions can get lost. Uh, so with that, thank you, Tim, for being here tonight and I will hand things over to you. All right, <clears throat> thanks for the intro, Robin. Uh, just to warn everybody, I'm, I'm getting over a cough, but hopefully uh, with enough water, uh, I won't have to resort to cough drops. So in one sense, this lecture arises from scholarship I've been doing over the past decade, uh, but more importantly, it arises from my experiences and observations in ministry and church life. In fact, it's for the health of the church that I engage in this scholarship in the first place. So to that end, I'm gonna talk about the relationship between duty and virtue in ethics for the sake of the health of the church. Uh, I'm going to try to keep this accessible and not overly technical. You can kind of think of this as a lecture for the church through scholarship instead of for scholars about the church. So coming out of high school, I was, I was thirsty for wisdom. My family had been through a church split while I was in high school, and my friends and I kind of drifted from various, uh, between various youth groups for a while. And being from a stable family, sometimes my friends would look to me for advice, right? But what did I know at 17 or 18 years old? Because of this, I started at California Baptist University hungry for wisdom. Uh, I wanted to learn wisdom, to share it, right? How, how do people make good choices? Uh, what am I to do with my life? How do I become more like Christ? Questions like these, right? I wanted to know how to think well about life choices. So I started at Cal Baptist as a philosophy student studying ethics. In my first semester, I discovered a philosopher named Immanuel Kant. He created an ethical system around a formula he called the categorical imperative. In it, he says, act only according to that maxim or rule whereby you can at the same time will or desire that it should become a universal law. 
So this is sometimes called the universalizability test. That's the universalizability test. You gotta say that 10 times fast. Uh, meaning whenever you're about to choose something, you ask yourself, what if everybody did this? What if everybody did this? So I thought this was great. I thought it sounded like do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Right, surrounded by what I thought at the time was kind of vague Christian advice, like read your Bible, be consistent, trust God, find your spiritual gift. Kant's categorical imperative felt like a breath of fresh air. It was specific, clear, and actionable. It also generated a duty-based ethic. Uh, and, you know, I had been raised uh, to do my duty whether I liked it or not, right? This is a good thing. Duty sounds great. So one day I was walking across campus. Uh, returning from my dorm after class and i saw some trash on the ground i thought if everybody picked up some trash as they walked along this place would look great and we'd be good stewards of god's earth so i started picking up trash right just a little thing uh this quickly developed <laughs> into a habit and i quickly developed some pride over it why doesn't everybody do this you see uh, that's the universalizability test at work if I'm doing it, I'm doing it because I think everybody should. When we're faced with the choice, or when I was faced with the choice between relaxation or picking up trash, right, I might just pick up trash. If everybody sacrificed a little bit of comfort for the sake of the community, that'd be a good thing. Well, eventually this pattern kind of started to break down, right? If I had homework to do, that was a priority, right? Perhaps I was too tired or had other things to do. But I didn't want to just give excuses or not doing the right thing. So I had to rephrase my universal rule to include some caveats. Everybody should pick up trash unless they're too tired or have homework or are carrying something. Maybe they're sick. Maybe they're with friends and don't wanna be rude. Maybe this and maybe that. I eventually realized that with enough maybes, you can make anything sound like a universal rule. Kant's categorical imperative didn't seem that helpful anymore. In fact, I didn't seem very flexible for different kinds of situations. And it made me prideful. So where's the morality in that? Well, this led to important questions. Me asking myself, what is my duty, really? And what is everyone's duty? Or more importantly, is there more to ethics than just duty? So Kant's apparently clear formula broke down and it drove me nuts. I either became obsessed and prideful or started to come up with enough excuses and caveats to excuse anything. I found myself becoming increasingly legalistic and judgmental towards others and confused about the transformative effects of the gospel. Now that wasn't just over picking up trash, that was applying those ethical principles to every area of my life, trying to be consistent, trying to uh, do the best that I could to follow my duty. So what's this have to do with the church? Well, it's not like it's not like everyone who struggles with legalism does so because they read Kant, um, but, but the bare bones of Kant's deontology is an attempt to universalize particulars. And that is something that we're all tempted to do. So, so what does that mean, right? What does it mean to universalize particulars? Well, you've got some universal principles like love your neighbor as yourself and particular applications like don't cut people off in traffic or don't elbow your sister at the dinner table, even if she is left-handed. Uh, perhaps you've heard some rules or homemade laws yourself, right? If you're a Christian, you should homeschool your kids. Never go to public school. Don't read books with magic or listen to secular music. Women should, should not work outside the home. Every man needs to know how to change the oil in his car, right? Never take out a loan. Drinking alcohol is always a sin. Or maybe it's more like this. Don't ever get a vaccine or you're a sellout. Or maybe on the opposite side, right? If you're an anti-vaxxer, you're paranoid. You may, maybe you've heard some of these kinds of things before, right? These are all examples of uh, when we take a particular and universalize them and tend to get a sense of pride and tend to use it as an extra biblical judge of someone's holiness or salvation or faithfulness or what have you. The point is that these rules often start well-intended, but they're legalistic. It's not enough to ask if they're in the Bible, because that question is likely already going to lead to a duty-based ethic by relying on proof texts rather than understanding biblical universal principles. I'll talk more about biblical interpretation in a little bit, but 
And the Bible gives us principles that help us become wise. A wise person knows how to apply principles differently in different situations. But don't confuse those particular applications with universal principles. Confusing the two is the core of duty-based ethics. This is Kant's universal liability test, right? When we make our particular application into a universal law, we're falling into legalism. We're making law. Kant says that you're supposed to make choices based on what you think everybody should do. But choices are for particular circumstances. They're not universal. They're particular. So collapsing these categories causes us to make new laws that aren't in the Bible. Instead, we should understand universal principles and apply them in contextually relevant ways while being humble enough to know that our Christian, that another Christian might disagree, you know, within reason, right? This is, we're not talking antinomianism here or relativism. Uh, there's a proper place for duty and proper limits to freedom of conscience subject to reason. Of course, we make laws all the time, and it's not always bad, right? I tell my kids, look both ways before you cross the street. Don't stand on the couch. Take your shoes off when you come inside. Take turns with that toy. These aren't God's commands. I'm just trying to teach them principles. These are training wheels. Eventually, they'll see the pattern and universal principles will click. Rules teach. Rules aren't the goal. I'm trying to teach my kids responsibility, sharing, and safety. I don't want them to just memorize rules. I want them to understand universal principles and cultivate certain kinds of character traits and habits. We call those character traits and habits virtues. If you want a simple definition of a virtue, a virtue is a habit that makes its possessor good. A virtue is a habit that makes its possessor good. We don't have them by nature, but we can, be, we, we can attain them by second nature, right? Through practice. Practice makes perfect, and through practice we can develop these dispositions. I don't want my kids to get caught up in rules and forget the weightier matters of law. As Jesus says in Matthew 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. So while making some rules is useful to cultivate virtue, we can take it too far. We take our particular opinion, interpretation, or application and universalize it. It becomes a rubric by which we judge other people's piety. Our pride inflates and we start to say, I'm glad I'm not like that tax collector or public school family. In the church, this can look like having a very narrow view of what counts as acceptable behavior or doctrine. A view that is more narrow than the Bible or classical Christian orthodoxy. It breeds unnecessary pride and division. Don't get me wrong, doctrine is essential and getting your interpretation wrong is dangerous. That's why I'm a teacher and that's why I'm giving this lecture. I think it's a dangerous interpretation of the Bible to think that the Bible advocates a duty-based ethic. We're constantly taking minutia and particular applications and universalizing them into legalism or moralism. So some theologians may call duty-based ethics divine command theory. That's one type of duty-based uh, theory, divine command theory. There's many different versions of this theory, and some of them don't actually look that different from virtue ethics. But in short, it says that God's commands create morality. I can't get into all the details now except to make two quick observations. First, as an example, murder was wrong since the dawn of time. Uh, we didn't need the sixth commandment to know that it was wrong for Cain to kill Abel. Cain knew it because the natural law was written on his heart. I'll get back to natural law in a bit. Second, if God's commands create morality instead of communicating morality, then God's moral character and his wisdom become unknowable. We cannot say that commands are wise because that's circular reasoning. We can't say that the reason he commanded these rules and not others is because they reflect his character. That would make morality based in his character instead of in his commands. So by contrast, natural law ethics, or what we're calling virtue ethics, by contrast, it says that the commands of God revealed in Scripture, which are also called uh, divine law, they tell us about the natural law. 
which is itself based in God's own character. And God's character is called eternal law. So those are a few theological concepts there. Divine law is God's command in the scripture. Natural law is, um, is the law of nature that's built into us. And we'll talk more about that. Eternal law is God's own character, the, the order that he has in hand. And, and a fourth one, just to throw in there, even man's law, which is sometimes called positive law or civil law, is binding insofar as it applies the natural law and doesn't violate it. In other words, the way God designed us to function is a reflection of his own character, right? The natural law is an expression of divine law as he creates. His commands don't create morality, but they communicate it like an instruction booklet. If you like, I can get into divine command theory more in uh, the question and answer time, but uh, we're not going to belabor that right now. There's a few key elements to duty based ethics that are at play here. A duty based ethic reduces morality to duty and rules. Uh, they are seen as the goal and the basis of ethics, the foundation, what creates ethics. When the rules are unclear for our particular situation, we tend to make laws or change them with excuses and caveats. This leads to the first problem our particular applications become universalized. You may think that that isn't you, uh, but it's all of us, really. It's a very human and thin inclined thing to do. There's always been legalists and Pharisees and moralists of different colors and kinds. In fact, at its core, this is the sin of Adam and the character of every sin. We make morality in our image, changing it to suit our preferences, our preferred interpretation of the Bible or our preferred way of doing this specific thing. A second problem is that duty-based ethics causes pride. If I'm universalizing my particular action, I'm going to ask why other people aren't doing it. Then I start to judge other people by my choice. I universalize it, and in doing so, I elevate my choice to the level of universal morality. I start out wanting to follow duty and to conform myself to God's universal standard, but I end up reforming that standard to be the way I like it. Again, instead of conforming to God's image, I'm making the world conform to mine. A third problem is that duty-based ethics affects how we read the Bible. Someone will say, uh, th someone will read the Bible looking for particular answers to particular questions. What does the Bible say about homeschooling? What's the Bible say about taking out a mortgage? What's it say about picking my career, about vaccines, about wearing masks, these kinds of things? It's good to go to the Bible with all of our questions, but if we're looking for a, a rule, we begin to treat the Bible like a magic eight ball or like an encyclopedia with a list of laws. You might not think this is you because you've been taught to read your Bible uh, well or do theology in a more nuanced way. You know, I mean, I went to seminary too, and I'm still tempted to do this. I used to be personally a lot more hardline about exactly the right form of family ministry or the precise process of vetting people for baptism. I used to think that if you didn't believe exactly what I believe, you were flirting with danger and might even be sliding theologically liberal if you weren't there already. Heaven forbid that your pastor wear jeans or that you have colorful lights on stage at church. Of course, individual churches need to make those particular choices, and they're important, and not all options are equally wise. But we can make our particular choices without being legalistic, without universalizing them. There's a modernist hermeneutic at play here that some people call biblicism. Biblicism, this is uh, the name of this sort of third problem that I'm highlighting. I can't get into all the details of hermeneutics right now, but biblicism is essentially a misunderstanding of the Protestant doctrine of sola scriptura that neglects the value of historical theology and relies on proof texting in a way that often leads people to accidentally smuggle in their own personal theology. In other words, you sit down with your Bible, oh, it's just me and my Bible, and all of my theology is just me and my Bible. Well, that's a little bit naive, and that's one of the first things we learn in seminary in er, interpretation is that that's just impossible because you are going to smuggle in accidentally unaware culture or presuppositions or ideas, assumptions from your culture that you may not even be aware of. In fact, 
uh, Martin Luther, you know, champion of uh, the Reformation, he said that um, it's very dangerous to read the Bible without relying on uh, theologians of the past, on tradition, right? Not seeing tradition as authoritative like the Catholic Church, but seeing it as a teacher. So it's often well-intended, this biblicism is often well-intended, seeking to base theology entirely on scripture, but without consulting historical theology or classical orthodoxy, it's often led, to, led dangerously close to heresy or even headlong into it. Again, I can't, I can't get into all the hermeneutics uh, about this, but maybe uh, if someone wants to ask questions, we can get into more detail on that. The point is, but there's more to morality and wisdom than just looking up a verse and finding your answer. Living a godly life isn't about finding and making a list of rules and then keeping them because it's your duty. If you've dealt with kids, you know that they can sometimes take your rules too literally. So my son might not stand on the couch, but he stands on a chair instead. My daughter might chew with her mouth closed, but still make gross noises. They might look both ways before crossing the street, but then still try to run across right before the car gets there. They might take their shoes off inside, but they still dump out a pile of sand at the same time. I might tell them, that's not the point. You understand, you know what I mean, right? What I mean is be safe, be courteous, be responsible, be considerate of others. Of course, they're just being children, but we adults can often treat the Bible the same way. As Protestants, we might feel that way about Catholics when they uh, talk about the Lord's Supper. They misinterpret Jesus saying, this is my body and blood too literalistically, saying that communion is literally Jesus's body and blood. That's not the point we can imagine God saying, you know what I mean. I think God thinks the same thing uh, when we think too literalistically or legalistically about many Bible verses. Proverbs says, train up a child in the way he should go and he will not depart from it. That's not a promise. Paul tells us that every person be subject to the governing authorities, but that doesn't prohibit appropriate and rare civil disobedience. We've turned Jesus' warning, your eye is the lamp of your body, into be careful, little eyes, what you see. That's fine, but we, need, but we can take it too far if our parenting style prioritizes censorship and sheltering over critical thinking beyond a certain age. For example, it's not a sin to listen to secular music so long as you're wise about it. Maybe in one family, secular music is causing sin, but in another family, it's not. Use wisdom to apply universal principles to particular circumstances in contextually relevant ways. We train our children not to fear and avoid the world, but how to navigate adulthood with wisdom. As, as I somewhat illustrated at the, uh, at the beginning with my story about picking up trash in college, Kant's, Immanuel Kant's attempt at universal ethics backfires, and it backfires in Christianity too. Duty starts with good intentions, and duty is still an essential, essential component of ethics as a teaching tool, but not when it becomes the goal or foundation of morality. We're all taught as kids to do the right thing, even when we don't feel like it, and that's good. But doing something with a motive of duty isn't the point. For Immanuel Kant, he says the only proper motive is a motive of duty. But if you're only doing things out of duty, it's because you are what Aristotle calls continent. You may know the right thing to do, but you don't want to do it, yet you do it anyway. This is only a halfway point to virtue, while the continent person does the right thing even though he doesn't want to, the virtuous person does the right thing and wants to. Then if duty isn't the proper motive, what's the proper motive? Well, Jesus says in Matthew 22 that the two greatest commands are to love God and love people. And in fact, love God by loving people and to love people for God's sake. He says that on these two commands depend all the law and the prophets. We are to love our neighbor as ourselves. When Paul repeats this command in Romans 13, he echoes that love is the fulfillment of the law. Jonathan Edwards says, the Bible makes it abundantly clear that virtue most essentially consists in love. And this is generally accepted not only by Christian theologians, but 
by the more considerable deity as well. So, should we love God and neighbor because it's our duty? Actually, yes, we should. We should love God and neighbor because it's our duty, at least at first or when we don't feel like it. It's hard to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us, but we shouldn't stop there. That's not the goal of the law. The law is training wheels. As Paul says in Galatians 3, the law is our teacher. As Jesus points out in Matthew 23 and the Sermon on the Mount, the law is teaching us the weightier matters of the law, namely mercy, justice, and faithfulness. It is teaching us that we should not only avoid adultery, for example, but even if we think of someone lustfully, that that's bad. In short, lists of rules are meant to give way to lists of virtues. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is an example of a list of rules, and there's plenty in the Bible. In contrast to duty ethics, duty-based ethics, we have a historically rooted virtue ethic based on what's called the natural law. To be clear, its philosophical form traces back to at least Plato and Aristotle, but Christians like Augustine and Aquinas throughout history have incorporated their findings as organizing principles in theology so long as they're biblical. Virtue-focused ethics has a long history, dominating the field of moral theology until the Enlightenment. After the Middle Ages, it was carried on even by the reformers and others, such as Calvin, Peter Martyr Vermigli, another reformer, and Jonathan Edwards, who I already mentioned. Aristotle says that moral knowledge starts by observing lots of particulars, lots of examples of right and wrong, and this observation gradually gives us insight into universal principles. We notice patterns. In general, bad parenting, as an example, leads to bad kids. Good parenting guides good kids. Not always, but enough of the time to count as good general advice. In fact, that's why Aristotle says nothing beats parenting for a good moral education. It's why Proverbs tells us to train up a child in the way he should go. It's not a promise, but it is patterns. Of course, in a reformed virtue ethics, we know that grace can be given to anyone. Right? Vermigli said, the reformer Vermigli, he says that we cannot exclude anyone from the teaching of sacred scripture because, quote, the power of divine words is incredible, recalling them to God, end quote. Grace and the power of scripture can change anyone's hearts. When Aristotle says, or Proverbs illustrates, that observation of particulars leads to understanding of patterns, general advice is the point. Proverbs doesn't give a list of rules and promises. It gives examples that paint a picture. A person who reads Proverbs eventually has their eyes opened to patterns of the world and the way things normally function. They come to understand universal principles that apply to everyone, but they also understand that those applications look different from circumstance to circumstance. So let me give a brief sketch of reformed virtue ethics. Right? What is that? Well, virtue ethics starts with the natural law. The term natural law comes from Romans 2, where it says, when the Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires. They are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. So natural law is written on our hearts. It's in our conscience. Natural law refers to the human nature God created and the way he designed it to function. Aristotle says that the function of man is a certain kind of life, and this is to be in activity or actions of the soul in accordance with a rational principle. In other words, natural law says God designed us to function a certain way. Our proper function, namely to act according to wisdom, is based on what we are as humans, based in our human nature, that God designed us to be in the image of him, in his image. Fulfilling this proper function is for our good and for our happiness. Aristotle says happiness is a certain activity of the soul in accordance with complete virtue. Vermigli says, 
a consideration of virtues is necessary as taken from the nature of happiness. Vermigli also says that while Aristotle neither affirms nor denies that happiness is given by God, the scriptures tell us that God is the author of happiness and our happiness is to be sought and expected from God. Even though natural law is primarily a term in Christian theology, its conceptual framework predates Christianity. Of course, it's in the Old Testament, but philosophically, as I said before, its roots are in Plato and Aristotle. And of course, we should expect non-Christians like Plato and Aristotle to be able to observe some things about God's creation accurately through common sense. Since Roman 1 says that his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. Now, Romans 1 also has a great example of the natural law at work. The sin of homosexuality is defined in Romans 1 as being sinful because it's a breach of human nature. It says, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving themselves the due penalty for their error. So God designed us to function in a certain way, and that's called the natural law. To add some theological terms to your docket, uh, we say that there's first and foremost that eternal law. I mentioned that before, right? This is, again, this is the character, God's own internal character as it relates to the world. So in other words, eternal law is providence. It's God's character shining forth, governing the world. Second, he creates things to function in a certain way, and this is the natural law. God's own character shines forth in the things that he makes. Broadly considered, natural law includes all the laws of nature. The universe has order, and it was God who gave it that order. The order and intelligibility of the universe is based on the order and rationality of God's own character. The mountains and oceans are beautiful because God's beautiful. Their beauty is based on his and points back to him. The laws of physics that make the stars go round show God's orderly control of the universe. And as we observe the universe, we know God's got the whole world in his hands. The universe is big to show that God is big. According to Creation Week, the crown of his creation is creating man. Now, all things reflect God and point back to him in some way, but mankind is uniquely made in God's image. In short, Humans are different from animals because we have reason, which allows us to know and love God. It gives us a moral responsibility that animals don't have. It also gives us an ultimate goal in life, an ultimate end, namely to know and to love God. But I'll get to that in a moment. Let's talk a little more about the image of God. We have something that the rest of creation doesn't have. Right? What does it mean to be God's image? Well. What do we have that the rest of the physical universe doesn't have? This is, these are some observations that Aristotle makes and that are completely in line with scripture. We have some stuff in common with plants like the basic powers of life. Aristotle calls this the nutritive power. Power just means ability. It's the basic abilities of nutrition and growth that all living things have. Animals have that too, but they also have the five senses or sensitive power as well as corresponding internal activities like memory, expectation of pleasure and pain, or the ability to have mental images, right? We know that dogs dream, for example. Of course, uh, once you have the senses, you can also have pleasure and pain, which is to say emotion. Simple in simple organisms and more complex in more complex organisms. This is called the appetitive power or appetite, also called passions. Since animals don't have an immortal soul, they're only physical. So we associate emotions as, emotions as arising from the body. The Bible calls them passions of the flesh. Whatever the image of God is, it's clear that we shouldn't live like animals or just be driven by emotions. Ephesians 2.3 says, We all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, where by nature, where we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. 
1 Peter 2, 11 says, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. So what's this thing about the image of God? What fights against the passions of the flesh? We heard Paul just say something about the soul, but that still doesn't tell us what the soul is or how the life of humans is to be characterized differently than animals. I mentioned how everything living has the nutritive power. Animals also have that, plus the sensitive power and the appetitive power. But some of them, even, even uh, some of them also have the locomotive power. They can move themselves around. But some things like us have the intellectual power. That's what sets us, sets us apart from animals. And uh, honestly, also from artificial intelligence, right? That intellectual power, which is an immaterial kind of thing. It, it might seem like I'm just kind of belaboring the point, talking about us having rationality, but the point in teasing out those five Aristotelian powers of life is to show the relationship to each other. This taxonomy was more or less taken for granted throughout history until only the past couple hundred years. In fact, it was just considered science. To be a human is to have reason, and to function well as a human is to follow reason by living according to wisdom, which is to live according to the virtues. But to be human is also to have a body, God made us physical creatures. We have a body that's similar to animals and a mind that's similar to God as the image of God. We're a hybrid. This is why the philosophers define human nature as rational animal. Rational animal. This isn't to say that we're animals. In fact, it's to say precisely that we are not animals, even though we have some things in common with animals, namely emotions that, lead, that need to be led and trained by reason. We have animal-like bodies, but we have a very non-animal mind. But we're both. We're a hybrid. We're a whole composed of both parts, the rational animal. And so we're not just, we're not an animal. We're different than animals because we have reason. And since we still have animal passions, what's the relationship between reason and emotion? Reason needs to lead emotion and not the other way around. This means ethics is based primarily in reason, not sentiment, as is popular today, thinking that emotions are just sort of, or morals are just sort of personal preference. Jonathan Edwards, for example, he was clear that he opposed, quote, those who say that virtue is founded in sentiment and not in reason. But another way of uh, thinking of this is an illustration given by Alastair McIntyre. Excuse me. So Alastair McIntyre. Uh, this illustration relates to the idea that man is designed by God to function a certain way. He says that man is a functional animal. And this is, this is following Aristotle's example, following Aristotle's sort of formula, right? Man is a functional concept. So, for example, if you think of a mailman as a functional concept, you know what a mailman is. Once you know what a mailman is, you already have built into that concept a prescription of what a mailman ought to do. If the mailman delivers to the wrong addresses or delivers broken packages, they aren't fulfilling what they are. The mailman is not fulfilling mailman-ness. So what a human is already has built into human nature an idea of its proper functioning. Since humanity is defined as rational animal, we are to live according to reason and wisdom while we're leading, while, while leading our emotions to delight in doing good. This unity of wisdom and emotion is a virtue. Virtues are habits of the will to follow reason. They're habits where our emotions are trained to follow reason. They're trained to take delight in doing the right thing. Now, remember back to when we we're talking about duty. Duty, when we have a sense of duty, we tend to do the right thing even when we don't want to. But now we have a clearer idea of a contrasting view. Virtue is, is following reason, which, of course, duty, ideally, is following reason as well. But it's following reason 
and it's creating habits in the emotions to delight in doing the right thing. By now, I might have lost you. Uh, what the powers, what are, you know, you might be asking, what do the powers of the soul have to do with duty or legalism or virtue? Well, God designed us to function a certain way. And we ask, what is it to be human? We're made not only to have the power of reason, but to use it. Peter Vermiglia says, possession without use is pointless. So proper human functioning is living according to wisdom. And since, since we still have passions and emotions, this means using our wisdom to lead our emotions instead of carrying out the passions and desires of the body or living according to the passions of the flesh or, as we might say today, following your heart. So let your heart instead follow your mind. I'm not talking about suppressing emotion. I'm talking about training. Calvin, John Calvin says, when I mention obedience, I don't mean giving lip service to God, but rather being free from the desires of the flesh, turning our mind completely over to the bidding of the spirit of God. Paul calls this the renewing of the mind. Christian philosophy orders human reason to give place, to submit to, to yield to the Holy Spirit. For it's not now we who live, but Christ who lives and reigns in us, end quote. So uh, legalism is often stoic, and Calvin talks a lot about stoicism. He mentioned Christian philosophy there. He was trained originally as a, a Christian philosopher, although he is known as a major theologian. He was trained uh, he went to school to, for philosophy, Christian philosophy, and he, had, he um, addresses a lot of Stoic beliefs, right? Legalism is often Stoic, suppressing emotion. It tells us to do our duty, whether we like it or not, and that that's, that's the apex of morality. That's where it's at. Well, when we're first developing good habits, we're going to need to fight against our sinful tendencies and fleshly passions by doing our duty, regardless of how we feel. But that attitude isn't the goal. Again, that's what Aristotle calls continence, which is only a halfway point to virtue. As we uh, do the right thing repeatedly, we gradually lead and change our emotions until we actually enjoy doing the right thing. The Westminster Shorter Catechism says the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. The pastor, John Piper, likes to rephrase this by saying, that the chief end of man is to glorify God by enjoying him forever. He called this Christian hedonism. It's a joy to glorify God. That's the point, not a mere duty. We don't do it begrudgingly. Obedience may start that way, but it shouldn't end that way. And it's not full obedience until it's done with delight. Full obedience is when our entire character has been transformed to be virtuous and our actions arise from these virtues. We, we give because we're generous. We're generous because we're imitating Christ's character. We're humble because we've been changed by God. Of course, having a mind means we think and we understand. This points to a second aspect of our ultimate end or goal in life. We're always seeking answers and trying to understand ultimate causes. Aristotle says that wisdom is in knowing causes. The highest cause and thing we hunger for most is to know God. Since our proper function, uh, since our proper function that God designed us for is to use reason well, our ultimate goal in life is to know God. Paul says in Philippians 3, I counted everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Jesus says in his prayer in John 17, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Of course, this isn't just speculative knowledge, but a personal relationship. It's not just knowing about God, it's being in union with him. The goal of human life is to know God and be in union with him to see him face to face. Theologians call this the beatific vision or blessed vision. Humans are designed with minds so that we may know and love God. Sort of two aspects of it. Uh, but another way uh, to phrase this, Thomas Aquinas clarifies that our ultimate end is twofold. 
We can think of it like a soccer team winning a prize or a trophy. The trophy or object that we aim for is God. So the goal of human life is to possess God, to possess him, to be united to Christ as part of the body of Christ. Knowing God is the prize we seek. But when we ask, what, what does that possession look like? In other words, what kind of skills or attributes does the winning soccer team have? The answer is going to be a little bit different, right? The soccer team has certain skills. What are those skills? Well, possessing God, possessing that prize, possessing that the object, which is God, possessing it looks like the virtuous life. Winning a soccer game looks like having certain skills. Those who know God are poor in spirit. They mourn over sin. They hunger and thirst for righteousness. These beatitudes are called beatitude because the Greek word makarios means blessed. Aristotle uses the Greek terms eudaimonia and makarios mostly interchangeably to refer to blessedness, the life well lived, the flourishing life, or simply happiness. Now, happiness in this sense isn't just pleasure, but it's a meaningful life, a blessed life that fulfills the proper function of human nature in the life of virtue. The reformer Peter Vermigli said, quote, blessedness is an integral reward inherent, inherent in a person endowed with virtue and not separate from his virtue or his actions. You see, we're made to know God and love God. So that's our goal, and that's the blessed, happy life. But this is achieved as a gift from God. Vermigli says, again, he says, uh, God is the author of happiness, and our happiness is to be sought and expected from God. He says our happiness depends on predestination, on the spirit, on faith, which are much superior to human virtues and actions, right? So, yes, we cultivate virtue by practice, by habit, but our ultimate happiness doesn't come from our effort. That object, that victory, that prize, which is God, is given, it's self-given as a gift. We possess God as he gives himself to us as a gift. In turn, that causes a change in us. We become virtuous. In our present, already not yet state, where, where we're still alive but not yet in heaven, we aren't perfect. So Paul says in Philippians 3, we press on. We strain forward to what lies ahead. We press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So those who mourn or hunger and thirst for righteousness or are peacemakers, as the Beatitudes say, they're characterized not by a checklist of duties, but by character traits that they act on. In other words, blessedness is obtained in possessing God, but that possession looks like a virtuous, godly life. Possessing God changes us. The image of God in us is partially restored in regeneration, initial regeneration. It's gradually restored in our life through sanctification and then fully restored in final resurrection and glorification in the end of time. This is called the ordo salutis or the order of salvation. God chose us to make us holy. Ephesians 2.20 says, but we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So the, the goal of God's choosing us isn't just to get us in the door, to get us to heaven, but to make us holy. He chose us for that end, not for that beginning. Initial salvation, justification, that's just getting in the front door. But he predestines, he elects, he saves us for that ultimate goal of perfecting us, making us holy, transforming us into having a virtuous character godly character that is an image of Christ. Once we repent, we start functioning like we were supposed to, at least in part. All our effort is now for God's sake, right? The, the axiom soli deo gloria, right? Only for God's glory. But what are we putting effort into doing? Does it look like doing our duty? It looks like cultivating godly virtue, character traits that imitate Christ, the fruit of the Spirit. Yes, we've got a duty to practice those fruits as virtues, 
but the ultimate goal and motive is to change our character to be godly, to take taking joy in obedience and functioning the way we're designed to. It's important to note that in distinctly reformed virtue ethics, the transformative effects involved in virtue are caused entirely by grace. I mentioned that a little bit ago, but let me delve a little bit deeper into that, right? Our works are a result of being gifted salvation. They're not a participation in salvation, as in progressive justification, which is uh, a Catholic view. As Vermigli says, quote, if we want to look at the happiness of justification and see how it's applied to us, there will need to be, there will be need for our faith since we are justified by believing, though we are not justified by the merit of that action, nor received into grace because of its work, end quote. He also says that many, quote, acceptable, uh, that many, many people, quote, accept grace in name, but remove its reality by making it common and available to all, as if it were up to the individual to receive or reject it. When asked who gives grace, to those who accept it and take it when it's offered, they point to free will. And the they that he's talking about is Catholics, because, because again, Vermigli is a reformer. So this points to a distinctly reformed virtue ethic. Now, I don't have room to go into all the finer nuances of how a reformed virtue ethic will be different from, say, a Catholic virtue ethic, but it's important to note that while there are vast similarities, there's also still differences. The, Re the Reformation didn't invent a new ethic. By and large, it actually preserved and defended the long history of Christian natural law tradition and its emphasis on virtue as a biblical framework for morality, even while it had to make corrections for uh, reformed virtue ethics, right? Like soli uh, sola gratia and things like that. So uh, just to recap a little bit, let's map out where we are. Duty-based ethics takes particular applications and universalizes them. I figure out something for my own life and then tell everyone else that they have to do the same thing. This might have to do with homeschooling or politics or church life or theology. It's a prideful endeavor that looks down on others and uses particular applications to judge another's holiness or salvation. Duty-based ethics is the kind of extreme that generates legalism, moralism, or Pharisaism. But the temptation now is to swing to the opposite extreme, known theologically as antinomianism, or more popularly as relativism. It says we can do whatever we want because, as Pinocchio says, I've got no strings to hold me down, to make me fret, or to make me frown. My point is, wisdom isn't going to be legalistic nor is it going to be antinomian. Instead, wisdom proposes an ethic based on virtue. What, what does that life of virtue actually look like? Well, it looks like the Beatitudes. It looks like the fruit of the Spirit. It still uses law as a teacher, as Paul says in Galatians, or as Aquinas says, the purpose of the law is to make men good. Virtue isn't a lower standard than duty-based ethics. It's a higher standard. That's why Jesus says, You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery in her heart. In a similar way, I try to train my kids. It's not enough to do what I tell you to. If you're not doing it with a happy heart, then it's not obedience. Now, uh, I've compared duty-based ethics and virtue ethics, and you might think that I've said nothing new. There's two ways that might be a good thing if you think I've said nothing new, and one way that might be bad. So it's good if you already understood the dangers of duty-based ethics and the need to focus more on virtue. If that's you, then let this talk just be an encouragement to you. In a second way, I don't want to say anything, anything new. I never really want to say anything new. I always want to say something old in a new way to help new people in a new generation with new problems remember an old way of thinking. Virtue-focused ethics is not only biblical, but it's, but it's being biblical if historically attested for more than a thousand years. In one sense, virtue ethics may be said to have its roots in aerosol, like I said, but it really is, um, it really has its roots in creation. 
in the natural law, in the way God designed us as a reflection of his own character, as the image of God. We're trying to live up to the image of God, which he designed us as. And he reveals this order to us throughout scripture. But since some unbelievers, some pagans had their eyes open, right? And they could observe the normal way that things are meant to function. Aristotle and other philosophers came up with some great observations that align with scripture. When Christians got a hold of Aristotle, they adopted, adopted uh, his helpful categories, right? The Bible corrects and clarifies and completes human wisdom and common sense. This is, sometimes this is called natural theology, but it's sufficient to just think that the Bible corrects, clarifies, and completes human wisdom. As a result, virtue ethics has been a predominant ethical system of Christianity throughout the early church, patristics, medieval period, the Reformation. If you think I haven't said anything new, there's one way that could be a bad thing. Many who think they are, many people think that they're not legalistic, but they actually might be, have that temptation, right? I myself have to constantly remind myself to not make new laws or demand obedience from my kids that doesn't really point to virtue. Fighting legalism is a daily fight. Our sinful selves constantly want to push to legalism. It isn't just the temptations Christians have. Non-Christians have their own form of legalism. Whenever anyone takes something particular and universalizes it, usually accompanied by pride and judgmentalism, it's legalism. Political parties, for example, have their own dogmas and legalistic adherence. There's many varieties of non-Christian legalism. Feminism is a legalism. Wokeism is a, is a legalism. They're legalistic about their antinomianism, about their relativism. They have dogmas and taboos. Some of these we catch and rightfully fight, but some do get absorbed into the church unawares because of culture or because we're not sufficiently equipped with biblical virtue ethics. I've heard strong Christians with good theological education say things that echo culture or counterculture more than the Bible. An example might be uh, discussion around self-esteem or toxic relationships. And actually, I'm going to skip that example because I realize I'm, I'm right at time here. So uh, I only have just a little bit more. Let me conclude by saying, where does this leave us, right? Um, remember that legalism comes from universalizing the particular, right? Duty without virtue is legalism. But virtue without duty will make antinomianism or relativism. If you have duty without virtue, you're missing the point of ethics. Our motive is to do good for the love of Christ, and our goal is to know Christ and become more like him. And, and uh, duty, duty is training wheels, right? It's instructions on how to function according to where, uh, how God uh, designed us, right? We start with sinful passions that we have to fight, but we change them. We train them we gradually enjoy doing the right things. Our character slowly changes as we grow. Um, let me just make one quick or two quick book recommendations if you wanna know more. If you want to read like an introduction to natural law, I encourage you to read Natural Law written by David Haynes and published by Davenant Press. Um, and if you just want a basic introduction to virtue and virtue ethics, I actually, uh, recommend Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. Although he's known for his kind of apologetics, Mere Christianity is basically an intro to classic Christian virtue ethics. And with that, um, I will uh, hand it over to Robin. And we'll, we'll start off Q&A here in just a bit. All right. Thank you. That was fascinating. That was a great, great talk. Um, we're going to take three minutes. Um, take a little break and to be thinking of some questions. I see some already, but um, remember to put them in the Q&A box and we will see you back here in about three minutes uh, for our Q&A session. All right, we'll go ahead and start our Q&A session. Looks like we got a few more questions. Um, let's start with Brittany. So how might using duty-based ethics apply to the way most people choose and or judge individual congregations, both their own and the ones down the street? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and, you know, it's these kind of questions and uh, this, this kind of like, okay, let's figure out what does this look like in my own life and in church life. That's, the, that's really, that's the point of uh, this talk, to get us to start thinking about those things. And um, the, so, so we have a tendency, I mean, I've seen it myself, I've seen it in people around, to, to okay, we think through uh, different things like, um, let's say, whether or not a church plays certain kinds of music or whether their, um, their order of service contains certain things that we like or don't like, or, you know, whether or not there's flashy lights or no lights at all, is there a guitar or no guitar, things like this. And we start to, we start to take these things and then uh, maybe, maybe at first their preferences, maybe not, maybe we've thought through them, but we, we add sort of thoughts and excuses onto them instead of asking ourselves, okay, like first and foremost, I need to ask, does it matter? Or is it okay that different churches make different choices on this thing? Instead, we have a tendency to just say, okay, like this is what I like and this is, this is why I like it, right? We, we sort of make the choice and then reflect on, oh, I like this kind of music because, you know, it's rich in history. But, you know, like, you know, old hymns were once new. So, you know, there can be different things like that where we sort of take our individual preferences, layer on some excuses, which really are reasons, right? And, um, but we need to have the humility to step back and say, okay, well, this isn't like in the Bible. Like this isn't a biblical law. I, I might be thinking this is the best application of a certain universal principle, but we need to have the humility and the critical thinking to assess whether or not really there can be a different set of Christians in a different set of circumstances who make a different choice, right? If, if there's just a city who is dealing with a different demographic, then they may want to do different practices because of a different audience. Or maybe they're just in a different country. I mean, it, it was a, it's a, a classic sort of problem in, um, <laughs> in older ways of doing missions, you know, like a, a couple hundred years ago and prior, where missionaries would go and they would, they would feel like they need to indoctrinate the indigenous people with the culture that they came from. Whereas you have people like William Carey who go in and they try to adopt the culture of the target people, adopt, you know, the culture of India and things like this and, and um, realize that the gospel is transformative and the way that that looks, that can look different in different cultures and different churches, right? Within reason, of course, it's not like all of those, different, as, I, as I said in my talk, it's not like all of those different choices are equally wise. But the point is that even if I think my choice is the wisest, I can still have the humility to say, hey, well, like maybe somebody else just because of their circumstance chose something else. Or maybe I'm not as wise as I thought. Or maybe even though I feel like I'm more wise than them, it's not like they're heretics for choosing like a different order of service. So we can sort of absolutize the particular and, and just, just remembering that kind of formula of taking a particular and universalizing it, it'll cause us to ask ourselves, how am I doing that? Really, I mean, that's what we need to start with is pointing the finger at ourselves. How am I doing that? Do I have the temptation to do that? Am I stopping to think, well, like, could this look different and it's totally fine? Um, and that also helps us distinguish between layers of importance. Right? I mean, like, you know, what your order of service is, is not nearly as important as whether or not the church down the street, you know, believes that Jesus is God. You know, there's levels here. So that's a great question. Yeah, great, great answer. Um, so someone asked if you could share the example that you skipped because of time. Yeah, um, okay, let me, let me jump back up to where I uh, was. Let's see. All right. So um, an example is 
maybe discussion around self-esteem. I'm just going to uh, go off of my sort of notes here, right? Uh, this discussion around self-esteem or another similar one is like toxic relationships. When the world says you need to boost your self-esteem and rid yourself of toxic relationships, evangelical Christians might respond by saying you need humility and forbearance instead. I mean, I myself have been guilty for, for years of saying, oh, the whole self-esteem culture is completely worthless, right? Or it's, it's bad, you know, or let's talk about toxic relationships. Or another one is like the Me Too movement. Different things, cultural things that pop up, we tend to just throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? So while the world says that you need to sort of boost your self-esteem and rid yourself of these toxic relationships, evangelicals might respond in that way. Um, but these, these dictums can sort of be universalized until people start to see, uh, start to think of like self-esteem as just an entirely pagan notion, right? I've, I've done that myself. But is, it, is really self-esteem an evil concept, right? Let's, let's really do the critical thing. Let's sit down and think, okay, what, what are the many possible meanings in different kinds of contexts? Instead of just sort of lumping all of those applications together under one title and then rejecting the whole thing, let's think, okay, what could this look like in different contexts? Or what could different people mean by it in relation to different things? Self-esteem, right? Is it really an evil concept? So the question really assumes this kind of legalistic perspective, and we need to guard against this kind of one-size-fits-all. So the Bible certainly doesn't say anything about self-esteem directly, right? So we shouldn't make a law about it that's extra biblical and use that law as a way of judging other people. Wisdom would have us think more carefully about the situation, right? Let's think about maybe confidence or pride or false modesty or humility, right? Lack of confidence could be the result of pride or false modesty. It could be a lack of humility, uh, when a Christian says that someone needs more self-esteem, optimistically, giving them the benefit of the doubt, they could just mean that that person actually needs more humility, or maybe they need more courage, or maybe they need more trust in God. Of course, the, the language is confusing because using the same language as the world, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to bring in lots of things that we might not want to, but don't necessarily have a knee-jerk reaction to saying, oh, anytime anybody says self-esteem, like it's a bad thing. Well, maybe just filter it through. Maybe that person hasn't thought through all of these things. You know, maybe you're educated, maybe, maybe they're not, or whatever. Whatever the case is, you've thought through these things, they haven't. So it's a way of stopping ourselves, thinking, okay, let me reassess. Like maybe there's, let's be a little optimistic and charitable, what somebody might mean here. Similar with ridding yourself of toxic relationships, right? Of course, the Bible says we should have forbearance, right? We should have love. We shouldn't just go around ditching any hard relationship or ridding yourself of any sort of toxic relationship, right? That could, however, it, it, it could mean something different, right? Um, while forgiveness is freely given, trust is earned, right? Trust is not the same as forgiveness. It takes wisdom to understand how to see that there's several universal principles at play in a given situation, right? Wisdom will have to figure out what to do on a case-by-case -case basis. There are situations in the Bible where it says, shake the dust from your feet. Don't throw your pearls before swine, things like that. And if in modern language, we want to say toxic relationships, well, we have to be careful but we also have to be careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater or assume that somebody who is saying that is entirely wrong. Likely, whatever they're saying is a mixture of right and wrong. And it'll take our wisdom and, and creativity and critical thinking to sort of separate out the good and the bad that's all mixed together in whatever that other person says or whatever we might say. So um, that's kind of the, the example. Another one. Um, is uh yeah like the me like the me too movement you know there's there's a lot that's wrong in that but it's also brought out a lot of uh, a lot of good sort of focus on on abuse really on abuse right and so 
um, there's been good and there's been bad all mixed together. And it takes us and our wisdom to filter that out and not throw the baby out with the bathwater, not sort of absolutize these kinds of things. So uh, this legalism versus virtue ethics, it's not only a hermeneutic for the Bible, it's a hermeneutic for life. It's a way of seeing people. It's a way of seeing the Bible. It's a way of thinking. And virtue thinks in a different way. Right, it thinks according to those principles, and that there's a difference between universal principles and application. So that's a great question. Yeah, great. That that's fascinating. Um, we have another one here. Aquinas tells us man's end is to know and love God, while the Westminster Confession and Catechism say it's to glorify and enjoy Him. Is this a real difference, a semantic difference, or something else? Sure. Well. Um, I'm a lot more familiar with Aquinas than I am with Westminster, and I'm going to have a tendency to sort of um, interpret Westminster the way I want it to sound. Um, and I think that has happened. I mean, I think that, uh, for example, when John Piper rephrases it as um, our chief, the chief end of man is to glorify God by enjoying God or enjoying Him forever, and then he proposes his Christian hedonism and things like this. I mean, I kind of I'm kind of annoyed that he doesn't use classical language, but what he's referring to is virtue ethics because his big influences are guys like Jonathan Edwards or C.S. Lewis who are big on virtue. And um, virtue is present a little bit in Westminster Catechism. It's the kind of thing that was, it's sort of in the air, right? You, you read, um, Luther, you read Calvin, you read some of these guys, um, you read a lot of different kinds of people in the Reformation, and they're not doing what Aquinas did. Aquinas is still to date the most systematic and comprehensive uh, exposition of virtue and of the natural law. But because of that, he was so influential in the medieval period, and all of the reformers were classically trained. I mean, they were you know, they were trained as Catholics, right? They were trained in that. So it was in the air. It was the foundation. It was assumed that uh, there wasn't really, there wasn't really competition, right? Immanuel Kant comes a couple, comes a couple hundred years later. Um, and so you don't have, for example, like Calvin or the Westminster uh, Confession or, or guys like this making a bunch of explicit or systematic appeal or, or discussion about virtue. But it's kind of in the air. And if you know what you're looking for, you'll see it pop out. So the mere fact that the Westminster Catechism says to enjoy God, I mean, of course, glorify God, right? That's almost just copying uh, Bible verses, right? To say glorify God. But what does it mean to glorify God? Like, what does that word, what does that word mean when we apply it to God, right? How do we glorify God? What does that look like? Well, it, at least the Westminster Catechism says, at least refers to enjoying God. And that is something that is just absent from a duty-based ethics. Or at best, we might say you have a duty to enjoy God. Even, even Immanuel Kant says that you have a duty to be happy, which is sort of like getting the cart before the horse. Like, what does that even mean? Um, well, I think it's a lot more sensical to think of duty as kind of the halfway point on the way to virtue. And so I can't say definitively what the Westminster Catechism is doing, but that's how I tend to look at it. Maybe I'm just sort of fitting it into the box I want it to fit into, but I know it's in the air. And I know that at the time, there's not, um, there's not like a competing systematic alternative theory. But as I said, you know, there have been legalists in every generation, so you don't have to be a uh, you don't have to have a theory or a system to be legalistic. And in the Westminster Catechism, there are things that are legalistic and that then make it into uh, the, the second, uh, the, the, the London Baptist Confession and gradually on down the line. I just, I just taught a Sunday school class on sort of the history of confessions. And one example is the regulative principle that, that finds its way in uh, the London Confession. And this is basically saying, you can't do anything church unless it's explicitly prescribed in scripture, right? So no drum, no drums, no, no hymns. Anything you sing has to be a scriptural text. It has to be a psalm. 
things like this. Although, I mean, this is legalistic. I think the Bible itself is teaching us to be creative and to write new songs and hymns. So that's just uh, some examples that go beyond your question, but I kind of shotgunned it and maybe I hit, maybe I hit somewhat on what you're after. Yeah, great. Um, we have another question asking how you would approach teaching the Ten Commandments, maybe in light of um, your vision of uh, virtue ethics. That's a great, uh, great question. So the Ten Commandments are commonly and have for a very long time been seen as a great representation of the natural law, a great expression of them. Like, like I said with Cain and Abel, you know, we didn't need the Sixth Commandment to tell us that murder is wrong in order for us to know that murder was wrong or for Cain to know that murder was wrong. He didn't need the commandment. But along the way, we lose our way, right? Um, the, the scriptures don't create morality, but they do communicate. They clarify common sense. They clarify, correct, and complete our common sense. Clarify, correct, and complete. So in clarifying, um, reformers constantly are saying that the, uh, the scripture is often needing to repeat what we already know by common sense in order to clarify and sort of add some extra force to it. So that when we say uh, the, the, the theological terms divine law, divine law is the commands in scripture. Some of them are kind of relatively arbitrary and dispensable at some point, kind of conventions like, you know, you have to build, you have to build a parapet around the top of your house so that your neighbors don't fall off when they come over for pizza. Um, this kind of Levitical law, right? This isn't the natural law, but then you have things like the Ten Commandments, right? These, these are an expression of the natural law. Of course, the big question can also be uh, the fourth commandment of keeping the Sabbath day holy. Is that part of the natural law or not? Well, um, it is, but there's sort, of, there's sort of two layers going on with the uh, Ten Commandments. Yes, they are an expression of the natural law. They're a repeat of the natural law, um, but they're also divine law. So that once you get the New, New Testament, you sort of have one of those layers kind of stripped off and you're left with a, um, an affirmation of the natural law. So with the uh, Sabbath command, for example, Right. It, as it's presented in the Ten Commandments, it's like, OK, this is one of the days of the week. Right. And it's represented um, in creation week and things like this. But with the fullness of scripture, we know that's actually sort of a, a typology or it's a, like like with other laws. It's a lesson that developed a habit that eventually taught something deeper than the law, just like so many other laws in the old testament or just like me giving some sort of rule to my kids right i, I don't mean for them to follow that rule when they're adults but for them in the meantime they memorize it they follow it they do the things they say please and thank you you know all these kinds of things until eventually it clicks and they understand so in the hebrews we have extensive discussion about the uh, about the sabbath and and sprinkled throughout the new testament in a couple of other places as well but the Sabbath is said to be fulfilled in Christ, that, the, that rest is the rest that we have in Christ, and that we take rest in Christ. So let's flip that back over to the commands. How do we see that as a command? Well, it's not, it's not the uh, seventh day of the week, right, from sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday. What it is, it's, it's our um, active need to hope in God, to cultivate that virtue of hope, remembering that we have that peace promised to us now and later, right? And so like in the Beatitudes, we are peacemakers. That's related actually to the Sabbath. We are Sabbath makers because we have the peace of Christ. We will receive the full peace of Christ. But in the meantime, we're on mission to make the peace and rest of Christ around us as peacemakers. Of course, you know, as the Beatitudes say, the result of that is not pleasant. It's usually persecution, um, such as the life of a peacemaker. 
All right. Well, I think um, unless there are any last questions, that's probably a good stopping point. Um, thank you for that. That was great, Tim. Um, remember to sign up for Davenant Hall updates if you would like to know when Tim is teaching his next course or when any other courses are. And remember to um, find Tim on Twitter and on his website. Uh, Tim, can you repeat? I can't find it here. Oh, TL I, yeah. Jacobs. Okay, yeah. TLJacobs.com. That's right. Great. All, all right. right. Well, thank you so much. Thank and you very and much. you all have a great night. All right. You too.